But in antiquity, who could afford to have a garden? Well, everybody was out tilling a field of some kind, but gardens were luxurious places, well-watered, beautiful, well-kept. That's where kings and potentates spent their, their, their free time. And so the very fact that this area was called a garden in the Hebrew Bible signaled that this is where the king lived. And who was the king? God. God. Yeah, it's Yahweh. <laughs> and his family. Very, well, that's us. That's where we'll be in the end. That's right. Return of Eden. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. What exactly is a tree of knowledge of good and evil? That's a... <laughs> uh, well, think about that for a moment. Was that a tree that gave somehow magically when you ingested the fruit? Uh, uh, I have uh, probably blasphemous uh, <laughs> on this way. I want to start from the. Can I stand up? One of the main differences between humans and other animals. How does that work out? The main two ways we're different from other animals is one, we're aware of our immortality. We know we're going to die. No other animal on this planet is aware that it's going to die. And the other thing is, we have a moral context. No other animal has a morality. If a, a lion sees nothing wrong with going into another tribe, killing the male, and killing all the children. We are the only people that have a morality. Mm -hmm. And we're the only people that know we're going to die. Right. And that's what these people learn in the garden, is that they're going to die, and that there's good and bad. That's why. That means they weren't human before they fell? Well, they were human, but they didn't know the good and evil part of them. Yeah, but according to that theory, then they weren't, they weren't human, they were animals. Well, yeah, we're, well, we're animals. Right. Weren't they given that warning before they you know, the that? We know there were other people there. <laughs> well, they didn't know this. Humans are different too because earlier in this, when God created the animals, the animals were created, you know, up from. But God breathed life into Adam, which He didn't do that with the other, with all the other, with the other animals. But yeah. where, where did you get the idea that the other animals were made out of dirt? Right. The main thing is that. Our Creator Himself designated us to become the rulers over the earth. Right. Yeah. He could have chosen chimpanzees. <laughs> here, here it is, right here in, in 19. It says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. Right. Well, Bond's right. <laughs> and so the Lord God, He likes living things, humans and non human alike. All right. But there is something about us. We were given a moral opportunity, an opportunity for moral choice. A couple of questions about it. First, I wanted to point out, we have two terms used in the text for God put the man in the garden. The first one up in 2.8 was just to set something in place. Here it's a different verb that means to give rest or to leave something in place. So it's kind of establishing this is our home, and we were to work the garden, but not the soil. That would be part of the curse, having to go out and really work the soil in order to get stuff to grow again. If you're like me, nothing really ever grows in your soil. I do have a question for you related to the tree here. How did Adam know what it is to die? The knowledge he got from the tree. He, he, he ate the fruit up from the tree. Disobeying Yahweh. The day you eat the rug, you're going to burp, huh? but you won't know what burp means until you do it. Or was this a warning that had some meaning for you? We don't have the rest of the story yeah. in this verse. That's right. That says God had a conversation with Adam and told him and explain to him, right. giving definitions. Here's your dictionary. Now, some 
young earth creationists insist that there was no death until yes. after the fall. I agree. But then there are others who say, well, if there were two human creations, the first one in chapter one, and those humans were running around, and if there had been enough time, they had sinned and began dying, then God created Adam and his wife, and they watched these other creatures dying. And God gave them clothing, two animals, or one animal, a big animal, yeah. had to die so that they could get clothed. That was when uh, death would be observed to them. Die didn't mean anything until after they had begun to die. Anyway, I just leave that as a question. It, remember what Mr. Fainan said, we quoted last time, I would rather have questions that have no answers than to have answers that cannot be questioned. Well, there's too many statements of it is good, it is good, and uh, it seems like death would not have been in the good category. Uh -huh. And then the word die doesn't mean you end. The separation of your body from your soul and your spirit. Praise the Lord. God. That's true. That's good theology. But did Adam have that theology? I should have read the King James Version. <laughs> A couple of other questions. We do know from the pagan mythologies of the time in which Genesis was recorded that there were beliefs about gods and the creating of human beings and animals and death and so forth. But many of the myths taught that the gods created the humans to become their servants and to do the work for them. Then the gods, of course, would eat, take the fruit uh, for their own purposes. But how does this account contradict the prevalent mythology? Or does it? Well, if you look at, if you look at the statement, take care of it, that a steward of it, you representing, it from their own, representing God right there. And notice who's doing the eating here. We would take care of this for to meet our needs, as well as to keep it a lovely place, perhaps guarded. So just how stingy is God? Why would he withhold that tree? You know, part of rearing our first child, when he was old enough to get up and walk around and grab stuff, we had a coffee table in the living room, and we put a flower pot in the middle of it. And of course, he came running for that thing. And as soon as he got near it, we said, no! No touch. And of course, he backed off a minute. And it was a few days training this kid that there was one thing in the house that was within reach that he was not to touch. Do you think he ever did? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but he, he definitely he learned until you were gone. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Hebrew here is always fun. We've noted before that the conjunction and is often used in an adversative or an opposite sense. It can often be translated or just as easily as and. Think for a moment, what if God had been saying the knowledge of good or of evil? Would this give us another view of things? Now, and when he said to know good and to know evil, in the context, this term to know something has little to do with simply understanding because in a few verses it's going to say Adam knew his wife and she got pregnant. It, it opens up the evil part. I mean, it opens up, well, it opens up Satan. With God being all-knowing, would, would he have known that's where Satan would have been hanging out? Well, of course. And he already knew that they were going to eat the fruit. And if knowledge here is experiencing could God be saying, there's one way to experience good, that which is beneficial. There's another way you can live, you can experience evil or bad results. By obeying, you're experiencing the good. Disobeying, you begin experiencing evil consequences, bad outcome. And so it's not a question, God didn't want us to know anything good or anything evil but rather by obeying, we, we really do experience the good. So kind of like, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good, which you will obtain when you obey, yeah. or the tree of the knowledge of evil, which you will obtain if you disobey. Something like that. Just going back on um, Adam's intelligence, he was able to name the animals in the same day, and uh, 
So you might have been smart enough like, from the start to know what death was. Kind of going back to no. earlier time. We also don't know how many days, weeks, months, or years he spent classifying the animals. For just that one day. 24 hours. <laughs> well, that was chapter one. Down in chapter two, there's nothing said about lengths of time. In fact, it's a different order of, as we've seen in the past. But this is this is part of free will. I mean, God didn't create us to be robots. He didn't create us to be robots. This is all part of free will. Here's your choice. Yeah. I mean, it's the same with those uh, divine beings that decided to rebel. Yeah. That was their choice. How could God ensure that his creatures sin without causing them to do so? He allowed the serpent into the garden. Serpent may actually have already been there. Well, if God created the garden, whatever was in the garden, uh, presumably he either created or allowed to exist within right. the garden. Yeah, yeah. Well, if the garden was where God dwelt along with spirit beings, and then eventually also us material beings, yeah, then we're all there in the garden. <coughs> but they were all created by him. But part of God's purposes in the creation eventually would be to allow evil, then judge the evil, and do away with the evil, so that eventually it would no longer be a question, it would no longer be a reality, or even a potentiality. He will do away with the evil, but it's not on this earth. <laughs> he solved the problem on earth with a real physical death. Right. And eventually he will extend his kingdom throughout the earth. A question in theology, God in advance and part of his purposes was to allow evil so he could deal with it and be done with it. But how could an all wise, loving, good, just God who cannot be tempted, scripture says, and never tempts anyone else to do any evil, how in his wisdom could he ensure that sin would happen without causing it to happen? Before he created the earth and all that is in it, he already also made the lesser gods, which Satan was one of those lesser gods. So he knew, yeah, he knew, he knew Satan's. But of course, we don't believe that he created Satan evil. But didn't he say something last week that God created beings that weren't perfect? He is perfect, but his creation is not perfect. It right. That's kind of a simple way to say it. So if it's not perfect, there's always that element of our possibility that a mistake can be. Exactly. Given a less than perfect being with enough time, there is always the potentiality of that being misbehaving. And in fact, eventually we all do. Yes. Even our children. Amazing, it's astounding as uh, our children learned to do evil. That seems well, a little disappointing to me, though, because I, I'm looking forward to a future of perfection. Right. And if, if this is true, then that future is not going to be as perfect as I think it's going to be. Oh, it will be. Not okay. on this earth. That's right. Anyway, in the future, God's Holy Spirit will be able to dwell with us in complete holiness forever and ever. He will have dealt with the evil through redemption, for which he himself will have suffered the penalties. Anyway, the book of Genesis is setting up all of the questions that eventually are to be answered through history, through the gospel, and through eschatology. This is not good for the man to be alone. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So what's wrong with the man living alone? From the start, had said, multiply and fill the earth. He couldn't do that alone. That's one thing. All the wild beasts and birds, weren't they, weren't they created male and female? Mm -hmm. to reproduce, but, but not, but not man. Those monkeys start, might start looking good to the guy. <laughs> <laughs> in order to get what God wanted, which was a huge human family, the man would need help to do that. Aren't you glad your wife bears the children? 
yes. The term here, I will make for him a helper. There is a, a homonym, if not a second meaning of the same word in Semitic languages, it can mean a warrior. Someone who fights alongside you. Or with you. <laughs> I will make, same verb, uses 126, uh, for him. This term here, the dictionaries, they look at other languages and all the usages of these terms, and they say, well, this means something like one who is opposite you or corresponding to you, your equal, your mate. And so various ways we can translate this. Helper works, but when somebody is my helper, who's the boss? You are. Exactly. Or I'm the one responsible. In 127, uh, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, uh, male and female. Yeah. So it sounds like that happened all at the same time. But we get over here to, to chapter 2, right. and we find that there's a little break between when he yeah. made the man and when he made the That's the second man. account. There's a whole bunch of people he made. So if you take it that chapter 1 and chapter 2 are the same human beings, then well, that's one of the contradictions between the two chapters. Does the first chapter try to say that's the caveman, the pre prehistoric people? No. Either of those are irresolvable questions, or we just don't have enough information. Or, since these are both mythical accounts, learn the lesson it's teaching, realizing that it might be partly parabolic. The lessons of the myths are clear. The details of the myths may escape us, but they're true. We really were created by an intelligent designer. Amen. Question here though, is this woman inferior to Adam in any way? No, but she was created second. All right, 1 Corinthians 11.3 says that the woman should have a covering over her head to indicate that she is somehow under the authority or the protection of the man. And then the man is under the authority of Christ, and Christ is under the authority of God the Father. But is that an issue of superiority and inferiority, or a uh, issue of position? Uh huh. All right, that's the question. All right, resolve it for us, Al. It's a chain of command thing, right, sir? A God and Christ is one inferior to the other? No. No, they're equal the Father and the Son, eternally God. And so the man and the woman are everlastingly human. But it's not a question of inferiority. Well, the woman was made from a sense, taken from his side and not from his foot. Uh, our scripture teaches us that the male and the female are equally important, equally needed, equally loved before God. We are both Adam. All right, he names the other creatures. The Lord God had formed out of the ground. All the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. What does naming imply in its biblical and historical context? Ownership, power over, power. Power over authority. God told Adam to rule over all of the other creatures. And so now he's beginning to do that. He's putting them into their place and he is now exercising that authority that he was given. When he was naming all of these animals, did he, did he use their Latin names? <laughs> <laughs> the question comes to my mind is, what language did he use? If he, if he wasn't there, who was he talking to? So, except that he and God in the garden, so was it a heavenly language, or was it Hebrew, English, or whatever, or what? I mean, that had that kind of mind to say, to be able to call a hippopotamus, or whatever, whatever name they gave him. This is a, a fun game that linguists do, to try to determine what was the language like several hundred years ago. So when I worked for the Norwegians, they and the Swedes and the Danes we're always talking about Proto-Nordic. What was our common language like before we, uh, the, the Danes lost their ability to pronounce consonants? 
So some have tried to take all of the language families and their grammatical structures and the etymologies of the uh, of the words and work backwards. What was the first language like? Whatever it was, it was extremely complicated. And even Hebrew, I've mentioned there are only two tenses in Hebrew, but every one of those Hebrew words has dozens of forms for the passive and the reflexive and the, how involved I am in doing it, how potentially true it is and so forth. English actually has one of the easiest grammars in the world. What was that uh, from the 70s, Esperanto? Is that <laughs> the, the, supposed to be the common language that they were going to have? Humans, however, if left alone, will develop languages. You know, there have been experiments of, of uh, children, for example, especially twins who spend a lot of time together, not interacting with other children. They develop their own language. Another reason the man needed the woman so he could have someone to talk with. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he, he had taken out of man and he brought her to the man. Why put the guy to sleep? Why couldn't he just have created it out of nothing like he did man? He made Adam, that is humanity, from the dust. Down here, though, oh, the man is made from the dust, but who? Oh, the woman is not. She's made from the man. I think that's pretty, I mean, to show the close connection between them. It's not just no, a man another. man will become one flesh. You know, if you started hacking, hacking into me, I would wonder what you were doing. <laughs> now you were sleeping when it happened. Hey, wake up. <laughs> Well, you know, there's another, there's only one other time that I think of where God put somebody to sleep. That was uh, Abraham. Prison guards. When he made the covenant with Abraham, he put Abraham to sleep. I don't know if there's any relationship between these two stories, but it's interesting mm -hmm. that there's, there's, this happens again later. I think one of you have already made the point that this is explaining the human origin of our mate. She's the same material that we are. She is not in any sense inferior or superior. You know, there are societies in the earth where the women rule, called matriarchies. In the USA. <laughs> right, myself, for example, I'm autistic enough, ugly enough, weird enough, that I never knew how to date. A couple times I tried, it was a disaster. And so I determined, <clears throat> nuts to it, I'm not going to play that game. And after I became a believer, I said, look, God, if you ever want me to marry, you will have to bring her to me. And he did. He did. He yeah. did. Yeah. We both knew it. And to be sure, I went and asked her father, rib or side or out of him in some way. Different term is introduced. Previous to this, we had the term to make in a general sense, bara to create, used only for specific advances in the story. Here it's a different verb, to build or con to construct. Again, seemingly with design and purpose. You can't hear us. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. All right, what do you see there from a scientific perspective? Well, the structural differences. The structural. The, pr the prettier of the species. Uh, uh, definitely. Skeletal structure, Adam is able to see that, okay, this one's more like me. And flesh, she, she doesn't grow, she's not growing fur. All right, the fleshly parts of her body, she doesn't look like a horse. And she shall be called woman because she's taken out of man. So far, we've had the term male and female. We've had the term Adam, a man and woman. But here we, we have two more Hebrew terms. For man, we have ish, and for woman, we have isha, which sounds like the feminine of ish, except that etymologically, they actually come from different roots. But they sound similar. And so linguists like to point out that whoever wrote the Bible was stupid. He didn't know the etymology of Hebrew. 
However, I ask you, what determines the meaning of a word? Is it past usage. history or is it current usage? Current usage. Yeah, current usage. Where does the W-O come from? That's woe to man. <laughs> By calling her woman, did Adam claim rulership over her? And in a moment, he's going to name her, give her a name. Was, was he trying to classify her with the other animals? Well, I don't no. think those are the same question. <laughs> I mean, he is expressing some sort of responsibility or uh -huh. authority over her, but I don't think that's therefore saying you're the yeah. same as the animal. That's right. He was <laughs> not. In fact, he was declaring her his equal by using a feminine sounding form of the same term. I'm leaning forward to 360, and he shall rule over you. Yeah, after the fall, yeah, God set up a system. Uh, so, uh, how does the terms man and woman correspond with male and female? Let's say the obvious. Man and woman correspond to male and female. And how does gender correspond to sex? Now, some have said sex, uh, okay, that's biological, but that doesn't matter anymore. Uh, gender is, a, what's the term we use these days? Construct. A construct, a, a cultural construct. Oh, man. That's... So, if I put on a, okay, what if I paint up my face? Then you'd be in the circus. Then I try to speak with a higher voice. Can I, I, love you. I now self identify as a woman. And you guys, you have to accept me. Is this being recorded? <laughs> oh, don't wipe that out. <laughs> well, it's funny because it's ridiculous, but it's. Yeah. But it's reality nowadays. Yep. Okay, however, I would like to suggest that gender is a cultural construct and a linguistic category and a cultural practice, but it corresponds to a biological reality. But there are other cultures, for example, in the Philippines. If you have too many sons in your family and you wish you had more daughters, it's a mother's prerogative to declare any one of her male children to be a daughter and to paint her up and put her little dresses and treat her as, as a female. Really? Yes. And they will grow up and they have their own terminology for such individuals. In that culture, gender is more a cultural construct than it is a biological reality. You just give me more reasons to be thankful for my mom. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I got a uh, dictionary for you. Middle English or Old English with man. wife plus man. The wife man. That's Miriam Webster. Okay, we're going to come back to this if we have enough time this morning. But I thought we'd better deal a moment here with marriage. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. All right, who said that is why a man leaves his father and mother? Editor. The editor, yeah. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided the transcribers of Scripture to comment according to the will of God. So a man is to leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Why does it not say a woman shall leave her father and mother and be united to her husband? Is it part of the authority thing that it's the man who takes the initiative and takes the responsibility. Reasonable sounding guess. <laughs> well, if the man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, doesn't that start another household, another issue? Yeah, so if you're in a patriarchal society, then the man is to leave and start a new household. In other words, you're not just adding on another female servant to the household. Which, in many cultures, is exactly what you do. You bring your wife home, maybe build another hut in the compound. But others have suggested that Hebrew, ancient Hebrew society may have been matrilocal, meaning you went to reside in the woman's family compound. There's another tribe in Africa where the man and the wife never do move in together. They just visit. So is this just simply a, a cultural artifact that we have reflected here? What they did at the Galilean weddings, 
you know, when Jesus was there because they would be patrolled for a, a year or nine months to a year. Yeah. And then they would not be together. He would go home and prepare a place, add a new rooms and everything. And then he, when everything was ready, which the father would say, because he's the one that, that agreed to <laughs> the patriarch, the, the, yeah, betray, that then he would go get the wife and bring her into his household. And that's when they would really become right, right. man and wife. <clears throat> However, the first night, where was that spent? Is Hebrew culture necessarily God's ideal? Well, even in Scripture, he, Isaac and Rebekah, it's a little bit different than the wedding of Canaan. That there are different different yeah. customs that were practiced right. at the times by yeah. the people, but some broad outlines are right here in this verse. Exactly. So we draw our principles from Scripture, not necessarily from later Hebrew culture. Although we assume that they were trying to pattern much of their culture after scripture. I do not consider sociology to be an adequate explanation of scripture. Were they created pubescent? Did Eve have any time to get used to the garden and being existence and learning how to live before she... She must have had some knowledge because she knew where the tree of good and evil was at. Well, there may have been weeks, months, even years involved and the, uh, the life of the garden, and even learning to live together before the, the, the fall occurred. When I read that question, I thought of the movie Blue Lagoon. There's a shipwreck, and these two little kids, oh. and they, they end up being the only people right. there, two prepubescent kids. Yeah. But they somehow managed to learn everything, and when they're finally found, they have a baby. Yeah. So I don't think we can scientifically determine what age they might have been when right. they were yeah. created. In any event, uh, I'd like us to realize that there may have been enough time here involved for God graciously to teach these uh, these two to live together. So how many wives, according to scripture, at least this passage, how many wives can we have? One. Why not two? I don't think it's good. <laughs> My friend in Nairobi said, more wife, one wife is more than enough. <laughs> the American system, and of course, is uh, uh, only one wife for a time. And we have legal ways to handle that. But then there's always the question of concubines. I knew a guy right here in the Portland area a few years ago, decided he needed a concubine. And he went to her family and arranged it. Of course, it wasn't legal. Now, we have this phenomenon in the book of Isaiah that talks about Emmanuel, the child that will be born. It says a virgin shall conceive. Historically and culturally, talking to a king, remember that's whom Isaiah was talking to, what was a virgin? In a king's household, there were three classes of women aside from servants. There were the wives who children could inherit. Then there were the concubines whose children could not inherit. And then there were the virgins who had been brought in to become wives or concubines, but who were kept separate for one full year to make sure that they were not already pregnant. So when told the virgin shall conceive, the king probably knew in mind exactly what young woman Isaiah was talking about. And so all of these things kind of relate back to Historically, linguistically, what are we talking about here? That Genesis stands as our, uh, our ideal. One woman for life from whom will descend our children. Uh, and what did Jesus say about this passage back in Mark 10, 2 through 9? Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. He had said, back at the beginning, it was not so. The question had come up about giving a woman a certificate of divorce so that she could legally show others, yes, I was very proper, I was married, I was properly divorced, I'm now free. I'm not a runaway, I'm not a slave. Why did Moses permit divorce? Hardness of their hearts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But why does the state of Oregon allow divorce? Hard hearts. <laughs> Chase. They don't have the spirit of the Lord, obviously. Right, yeah. Because the lawyers need money. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's it. 
But in any event, the Lord Jesus himself acknowledged that the Genesis account was, let's say, how things were at the beginning. He accepted this account as the rule of God. And so if we reject the story of Genesis, we are rejecting the teaching of Jesus. And in so doing, we relegate Jesus to the category of a mistaken, deluded, first century amateur rabbi. Well, he didn't know as much as we know now. Oh. <laughs> oh. Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Towards a biblical position on gender and marriage. What does Genesis seem to teach about male and female, man and woman, husband and wife? There are real things that you're not supposed to fool around with. <laughs> they were created to be together. And Adam didn't find anything suitable in the animal kingdom. <laughs> Man and woman, by definition, are male and female. And in the relationship, they are husband and wife. And that's it. That's the pattern. That's what we live by. What were the first humans commanded to do? Procreate. Mm -hmm. Procreate. To multiply, what must a couple be able to do together? And raise children. They must be well, not only to rear the children, but to rear them. Must be able to bear well, children. Right. Okay. Be fruitful and fill the earth. Right? Yes. Yes. Now, the book of Leviticus, for example, has a number of very graphic descriptions of sexual practices that are forbidden. Every one of those practices either is not able to bear children or it is very destructive to the family unit. Basic human morality, biblically speaking, revolves around the fulfillment of the command to multiply, to fill the earth with children. But morally, if I'm, what I'm going to do with another individual, can this bear children and does it respect the family structures? Everything else is immoral. But what if I self-identify as another gender? Then you're not listening to the science. Or you're not listening to the science, and you're not listening to creation. No. Or argument I heard last evening is, well, there are always secondary characteristics of human sexuality. And those have to be respected just as much as the primary ones. What's the reply? The secondary or secondary? Yeah. The primary is first. Well, we've got to destroy two cities for that. <laughs> Romans 1. Okay. Well, isn't it that, like the serenity prayer, Lord, help so me to accept right. the things I, I can't change? And gender is one of them. I might maybe yeah. identify as a woman. Well, I need to get my identity. But what if I feel attracted to my same gender? Well, step up from being attracted to animals, so. Isn't this interesting? If you are a straight male who like women, Amen. You are expected to be moral and faithful. But if you're attracted to your own gender, that doesn't matter. You can be as profligate as you wish. So if you feel attracted to your same gender, well, here's what God wants you to do. Nothing. Because if the, if the straight man is expected to live a moral life, keep his hands off other women, and to be devoted to his wife, it's no harder for you guys. Hey, I love my wife, I admire other women, I fantasize about other women, but I don't go after other women by the grace of God. Ask God for the Holy Spirit, for self-control, and to work on you. So you just, just because you're queer gives you no right to be immoral. And what did God do in Romans 1 and 24? So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Right. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself. And we go back to Leviticus, all those long passages about immorality, they're often mixed with idolatry. So right from the beginning, the rejecting of the law of God usually results in the rejecting of the true God. What do you think? Should the state enact all laws about these? My hope is that you and I appeal to the book of Genesis regarding all questions of basic morality so that man and woman 
husband, wife, male and female, those are direct correspondences.